Hi guys, my name is Olivia. I am one of Dr. Salome's nurses. Um, if you don't recognize me, I'm usually in the OR or in the recovery room, um, helping patients and getting them out, getting them home. Each week we will be talking about different topics. Um, typically those are brought to us by you guys. So feel free to keep bringing those to us. We love to hear and all the comments and feedback. Um, today specifically we'll be talking about implants. Um, soonly I will let Dr. Salome talk about all of that. Thanks for joining us guys. So today I thought it'd be kind of fun. Actually it was Olivia's idea and she was right about it. To spend a little bit of time talking about implants and all the different options you have. What I want to do is kind of go over it, uh, the implant uh, information first and then um, answer as many of your questions as we can get to and then uh, just take it from there. So probably one of the biggest questions I get is what kind of implants right for me? What are the choices out there? What can I use? So I want to show you some different options so that um, you can get some good information and that way you can pick the right implant for yourself. A broad way of thinking about it is that you can divide implants into saline and silicone. Now both implants have a silicone shell. It's just a question of what is filling the implant. So saline implants come in kind of two varieties. You have the traditional saline implant, which looks kind of like this. It's basically a single bag of saline, and then, or, I'm sorry, single bag of silicone, and then it's got a little valve right through there. You can kind of see it right there. It comes deflated. We fill it with saline during the surgery, and then we close that little valve. This is, um, these implants have been around a long time. Um, and pretty straightforward, pretty easy to use. These are the least expensive type of implants that we offer. Um, what's the advantage of this implant? Probably the biggest advantage is that if there's a leak of the implant, um, the implant will deflate and you will know right away that there's something going on, at least within a few days. And then we just, you just see us, we take out the old implant and put a new one in. It's got some disadvantages though, and, you can, and for most patients, you can, you'll be able to feel those disadvantages. You can see it looks kind of wrinkled even when it's filled, even when it's overfilled, you're still gonna have a lot of rippling to it. If you are super, super skinny, li very little breast tissue or fat on your breast, um, you're really gonna be able to feel those differences or even see those ripples. Um, if you have a fair amount of breast tissue or, or maybe some excess fat around the breast, you're probably not gonna notice it as much. Um, so it's just something to think about and we'll discuss that more as we're um, during your consultation as to what would be the best choice for you. The other type of saline implant, which I really like, is what's called an ideal implant. Um, that's a relatively newer implant, but one that's gaining a lot of popularity really quick. I want to see if I can just sit both of these next to each other so you can see the difference. So here is the ideal, and here is a regular implant. Now, obviously, there are different sizes and different fill, but when you look at the ideal implant, you see how it looks pretty rounded at the top? Now, that has to do with how this implant is constructed. Um, it actually is not just a single bag of saline. It's actually got... Um, a bag with baffles in it. I'm going to show you what that looks like on the inside. And it's got two valves, one in the front and one in the back. And this allows us to fill um, the ideal implants to different volumes and create this nice full appearance. And if you look at the implant on the inside where it's cut, I'm going to try to show you guys that. Do you see how there's all these little uh, baffles, these little layers? Let's see if I can get, get a good look at that. Thanks, Olivia. So those baffles are kind of like the baffles in a, in a ship where the saline, once it's inside, those baffles keep it from sloshing around. And so it, the implant holds its shape a lot better than a uh, traditional saline implant does. So for my patients who come in and say, um, you know, I, I, I really would prefer to have a saline implant, then this is the one that I would recommend. I think you would do really well with it. Um, I think in my opinion, far uh, superior in terms of shape and look to a traditional saline implant, but maybe not quite as nice as the new highly cohesive gel silicone implants. So I hope that makes sense for that. Um, the next thing I want to do is I want to show you some options for silicone implants. And this is still, these implants are still by far the most popular ones we put in. This is what almost all of our patients want. Um, there are different textures and profiles and shapes of implants, and we can get into a lot of discussion about that. There are uh, implants whose surfaces are smooth, which is the ones that I use almost exclusively now. Um, there's implants whose surfaces are textured. Uh, I don't personally like using those because in my opinion, they don't offer any significant advantage for most patients. Uh, some surgeons would disagree. They like to use them. Um, but for me, I think that the smooth implants offer 
really nice look and feel. And they don't, uh, and sometimes textured implants can cause patients some problems down the road uh, with um, uh, reactions that the body could have to that texturing, uh, uh, that textured material. Uh, you don't really see that with smooth implants, so I really like using smooth. They come in different sizes. They start at about 110, 120 cc's, which is about four ounces. They go all the way to about 800 cc's. Those are really large implants. Um, and when we're thinking about sizing, we want to look at the type of implant, the size, the volume, and then the profile. And that's going to be a really important thing. So let me explain to you what I mean by that. Okay. I want to sh oh. Whoops. Oh, sorry. Okay, so here we go. <laughs> so let me show you, for example, what I mean by profile. So these two implants are both about the same volume, around 125, 140 cc's. This is a low profile implant. This is a medium profile implant. Now what you'll notice is the shape is different. This one's a little bit wider and flatter. This one's a little bit narrower and more projected. So when we say, when we're talking about the profile of the implant, like for example, if you hear low, medium, high, or ultra high, we're not talking about high like up and down on your chest. We're talking about high as in projected off of your chest. And so when you look at these, you can see how for about the same volume, this implant is wider and this implant is narrower. That's how we determine which is the right implant for you. So in other words, if you said, when we size you and we examine you that you decide you want an implant around 125 cc's, that's, uh, and, and that's a little bit on the small side for most of our patients, but just as an example, what we would do then is find out how wide your breast is and then pick the profile that's gonna fit most comfortably within the breast. What we don't want is an implant that's wider than the width of your breast. That doesn't look right. So what we ask patients to do is give us a sense of the amount of fullness you want, and then we pick a profile for you. Are profiles, the um, is that only a characteristic in silicone implants? Great question, yeah. The, so they have profi different profiles in saline implants as well. Um, saline implants, the traditional saline implants have, uh, the ones that I've seen, you have three profiles, sort of low, medium, and high. Um, silicone implants now, the ones that we use have five different profiles. Uh, I believe at the moment, ideal implants just have one profile, and we can adjust a little bit of that based on um, how much we fill it. Uh, but silicone still gives you, by far, m the most number of different options for the sizing. Um, so that's, that's that part. Um, so I hope that makes sense in terms of the profile difference. Now we also want to talk about the, and this is also another example of that. Let me see if I can show, uh, for larger implants, see if I can show that. So these two implants, this are, they're also about the same size. This is 360 medium profile and this is 360 full profile. So you see the difference. This one's narrower and more projected. This one's a little bit wider and not quite as projected. Most of our patients that we see are picking implants either medium to full and then we have maybe 20-30%, maybe 20% that are picking the low plus profile, and then maybe about 5-10% that are picking the ultra high profile. Um, hope that makes sense. Now, in addition to the profile, there's also the, the how, how should we put this, how cohesive the gel is. Now, all the implants now that we use are, have a cohesive gel. None of them are a liquid silicone. They're all a solid silicone. The question really is how solid is the silicone? And we pick there's, there's usually two or three different levels of cohesivity. We pick the one that's gonna work best for the patient based on what their goals are. So let me explain to you what I mean by that. First, I wanna show you the old silicone implants. These are maybe two or three generations behind, and I wanna compare them to the most cohesive gel we have now. These implants are both about the same size and about the same profile, but do you see how the old one kinda of caves in in the middle? You can see that? Versus this one holds its shape better at the top. That's about how cohesive the implant is. This is a much more cohesive implant. The more, the more cohesive it is, the less likely you are to feel or see rippling, and the more likely you are to get more fullness at the top of the breast. So one of the things I think about is, what does the patient want? Occasionally I have patients who will say, I wanna have a lot of fullness at the top. That's the patient we'd like to use the most highly cohesive gel implant possible. On the other hand, I also have a lot of patients who say, no, I really want it to look more subtle, more natural. I don't want folks to say, oh, wow, you know, she definitely has some implants. That, those, in those patients, we would use a, more, um, a less cohesive implant. So I wanna show you kind of the difference between those two. This implant on the right is the most cohesive. 
This is just one step down from that. I'm not sure you can tell in the picture, but this one has a, it's a little bit softer at the top and this one's really uh, rounded at the top. Same volume, same profile, just a little bit different in terms of how they sit. So we will tailor that to the patient. So what does that mean? We need to pick the type of implant, saline or silicone. Within that subset, if we're doing saline, are we gonna do regular saline or are we gonna do ideal? If we're gonna do silicone, we're gonna talk about the size, the profile, and the level of cohesivity, how cohesive. And with all those variables, we can get a really nice option for each patient. Are those considered gummy bear implants? Yeah, so the, gummy, the, I, the, the term gummy bear is used pretty loosely with uh, different surgeons. I think the best way of thinking about it is when we say gummy bear, what we're talking about is not a liquid implant. We're talking about a cohesive implant. How cohesive depends on which one of these we choose. So I think about it personally, I think about this all, in, all current silicone implants as a gummy bear because they're solid, they're not liquid. The more cohesive you get, the firmer they will get and the better they'll hold their shape at the top. Um, so that's I think implants kind of 101. The best thing to do when we're doing our consults is uh, we will, and as Olivia alluded to, we can start by examining some pictures, go, going over with every, everything with you in detail. Uh, and then when we see you in person, that's when we do all of our measurements, um, really do a good exam, pick out the size implants and uh, sort of a range of implants that would work well for you. We have our nurses help you try them on with a bra and a t-shirt. Sounds pretty simple, but I gotta tell you, that's a really effective way of getting a sense of how much fullness a patient wants. We don't really base it on cup size because everybody has a different cup size based on where they get fitted or what their particular goals are for the surgery. So we wanna size you with actually looking at the implants together. Um, one thing Olivia was talking about with the virtual consults, one thing I wanna add to that is that those um, complimentary virtual consults in April, they also include a complimentary consult in person in our office afterwards. So if we, do, if we get your consult done, then we'll definitely see you afterwards and uh, do a regular full consult for you, no charge as well. So I wanna make sure we're taking care of you guys. A question is, are there advantages to an implant being under the pec muscle compared to on top of the pec muscle? Yeah, great question. So in, uh, the answer is yes. So most of the time we're putting implants behind the muscle. Now, why are we doing that? There's two big reasons. Number one is that muscle adds another layer of camouflage to the implant, especially in the upper inner portion of the breast, which is the most, uh, what we consider the most cosmetically important or cosmetically sensitive area. We don't want you to see any rippling if you're wearing like a low cut dress or a swimsuit. So that muscle adds that other layer of camouflage. The other reason why it's important is and the data is pretty clear on that, especially when we're talking about smooth implants, that if we go behind the muscle, it reduces the risk of capsular contracture compared to an implant in front of the muscle. As some of you may know, what capsular contracture is, is the body's reaction to the implant. Now, every, everybody makes a scar around the implant on the inside. Most of the time, it's, it's uh, soft, thin, you don't know or you don't feel or see that you have it. But in some patients, it becomes firm, it becomes kind of hard and it looks, one side will look different, one side will feel different, the implant may even look tight or high or riding up, that's called capsular contracture. If we put the implants behind the muscle, we reduce the chance of that happening, we don't eliminate it. There are some patients that are gonna get a capsule no matter what we do, um, but this does bring the uh, risk down quite a bit. Another question is, is there a price difference between the highly cohesive and the ideals? Uh, oh, good question. So. I don't want to say the wrong thing. <laughs> I know that the ideal of the saline implants, the ideal is more expensive than the regular. Of the silicone implants, the highly cohesive gel is more expensive than the regular implant. And what I mean by more expensive, all I mean is the cost of the actual device of the implant. Our surgery fees, the anesthesia fees, the OR fees, those are all the same. It's just what it cost us from the manufacturer to get you that implant. I think that the regular cohesive implant, silicone implants, and the ideal are about the same price, but I'm not a thousand percent sure. My, my coordinator, uh, Rebecca, will be able to tell you guys when you call and chat with her. Another question is, is there any way to predict or foresee um, who would have a deformity? I guess maybe capsule related? Yeah, like a capsule contracture. You know, I wish I could tell you, if I could figure that out, if I could predict it in advance, um, I'd be saving a lot of patients and surgeons a lot of headache. There just really isn't. Um, there are some things that we can, so there's this list of things, there's about 14 things that we can do during surgery to reduce the chance of a capsule forming. Um, there's pretty good data on that. We do all of those things, but 
and with that, our rates come down quite a bit, but they don't go to zero. And the reason why they don't go to zero is that some patients are gonna develop it no matter what we do. Um, I, I really wish there was a way I could say, oh, this patient based on X, Y, and Z, their history or, or whatever, their anatomy is gonna develop a capsule. There's no way of knowing that for sure. Um, she wanted to clarify, that's not what her question was, um, an oh, animation sorry. deformity with their oh. pulp muscles? Yeah, so that's a great question. So there's always a possibility of develop, developing an animation deformity. Um, it's interesting that, in, at least in my practice, I tell patients that can happen, um, and patients will sometimes even say, yeah, you know, when I really squeeze my pec really hard, like when I'm working out, the implant really moves. Um, I wish there was a way to say there's no chance of that happening or there's something we can do to guarantee it won't happen. Some women are gonna develop it. The truth is it doesn't seem to bother our patients uh, afterwards very much because it's really only when they're engaging the pec, so like when they're really working out hard, like pushing like a bench press or something like that. Normal activities, normal things, they don't seem to uh, notice it or it doesn't seem to bother them very much. Um, another question is if they're going from low uh, profile saline to a high moderate profile silicone, would that fill the room where a lift might be needed? Yeah, so that's something we really have to take a look at you and, and know for sure. Um, I always tell patients if you need a breast lift, you need a breast lift. There is no implant, no size, no profile that removes the necessity for a breast lift. An implant is designed to take your existing shape and make it fuller. It's not designed to lift the breast tissue. A lift is designed to lift the breast tissue and make the shape better. So be very careful about, um, oh, how should I put this? Be, be very careful about being sort of sold this idea that you don't need a lift, we'll just put in really big implants. I've, I've seen patients come to me who've had um, different docs, um, uh, usually not board certified plastic surgeons, um, put in, imp tell them, you know, I know these docs all say you need a breast lift, but we'll just put in a really big implant and we'll put it in front of your muscle to take up all that loose skin, and then you won't need a lift. You know, that's a, that's a really, I, I don't think a wise thing to do. Uh, the swelling will make it look pretty good for a week or two, and then it's just gonna really drop. So I, I would urge you not to do that. Um, another question is, if someone has a history of keloids forming, could you predict maybe a tighter capsule? Yeah, you know, I've, I've actually been asked that a lot. Um, there is nothing to support a connection between the two. The keloid is really a, a skin issue, um, and the, impl the capsule is really a reaction internally to a foreign body, which is the implant. No more questions right now. These are good questions. You guys are <laughs> keeping me on my toes. Um, so. Well, we'll keep taking the questions there. I also have some questions that were sent in to me earlier. Um, some are implant related, some aren't, um, but I figure you guys would probably want me to just go ahead and answer them. So why don't we do that? Let's see. I have a question from uh, Kat Barr asking me to explain the drainless tummy tuck and it, uh, the difference between that and the traditional and who's a good candidate. So this is a great question. So for years and years, uh, I've been using drains for tummy tucks uh, like many surgeons, in fact, most. Um, and then over the last couple of years, there's been um, a lot of data uh, about, in, about performing a tummy tuck without the use of drains. And what I've noticed is that even when we put drains in, the reason we're putting drains in is to try to prevent a seroma or fluid collection from forming. But even in those cases, no matter what we do, some patients are gonna develop a seroma. And I've been pretty slow to adopt the idea of a drainless tummy tuck because I was just really nervous about people getting it. But there's a way of doing it where we're actually using what's called a pr uh, progressive tension sutures, where we're actually putting in these sutures as we're bringing the skin flap down, we're almost quilting the skin flap down onto the muscle, and that eliminates any real space for fluid to collect. What's nice about that too is it really keeps the skin tacked down. We can actually pull and remove some excess skin. And I've been very happy with how, it, how we do it, or how it looks when we're done. Um, I don't think there's, I think you can pretty much do this on just about any patient. The one caveat would be if someone is, has a really large surface area that we're trying to tack down, or if, for example, we're putting them on a blood thinner post-op to prevent a blood clot, they can be a little bit more um, kind of weepy or oozy during the surgery. And in those patients, we would probably still do the progressive tension sutures, but also put in a drain just as a backup, but maybe one drain instead of two. Um, another question on here is how does and implants behind the muscle affect older demographics in regards to excess skin tissue as they get older. Will the implant have some grouping with the skin, skin yeah. tissue? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. I always tell patients that no matter what we do, we're fighting time, age, and gravity always. 
Um, it just in, in the same sort of it's the same idea with the breast lift. If the skin is loose, we need to do something to remove that excess skin. No matter how big of an implant you put in in front or behind, that skin is still going to persist to some degree. So we really need to address that. Sometimes we do it as two stages. If, if we're not sure we need to do a breast lift, or if the patient's not sure they want one, we can put in an implant, let it settle for a few months, let see what the, if the patient likes it or not, and then we can always come back and do a lift. But I think if we're putting implants in, it's it's something that is going to age with the patient. Their tissue is going to age. Usually, it loosens up a bit over time. But everyone's different. I have patients coming in, you know, in their 60s who had implants 20 years ago who still look great. They still look really, really good. So it's it's not a um, it's not one answer for every patient. It's different for everybody. Would you be able to do a breast augmentation and a BBL at the same time? Yeah, so we do combine surgeries a lot. Um, a little bit of it depends on the patient and her anatomy or her risk factors, age, all that kind of stuff. But a BBL and a breast augmentation is actually a pretty common um, uh, combination of procedures. So yeah, we could totally do that. For most patients, we can totally do that. Another one is how often does breast implant illness happen and does it matter what implant was used for that? That's a really good question. So every surgeon's practice is different. In my particular practice, I don't see hardly any patients that are coming in for, uh, with breast implant illness uh, complaints. Um, that's different. There's some surgeons that's like a big part of their practice. So I don't see that a lot. I don't know of any correlation between a particular implant and breast implant Ill illness. Now, sometimes folks are getting the the, the nomenclature wrong. There's something called breast implant illness, which some people believe is real, some people are more skeptical about. Um, and there's also something called BIAALCL, which stands for breast implant associated. Um, it's, a, it's a basically a lymphoma of the capsule of the implant. That is a very real thing. It only seems to be occurring with textured implants, and the risks are awfully low with those. It's about one in 3,000 to one in 30,000, depending on. Um, what studies you look at. Um, and those numbers are changing, but that's about what it is. To put that in perspective, the risk of a woman developing just regular breast cancer at some point in her life is about one in nine. So it's still a really low risk, but if we're putting in smooth implants and not ever using a textured implant, um, the chance of that happening is about as close to zero as we're gonna get. I have not seen any report of that occurring with just a smooth implant. Do you have to get your implants replaced every 10 years? That's a very common question. I appreciate that being asked. Um, so there is no absolute expiration date on the implants. There are women who have implants for 10, 20, 30 years, even longer. It really depends on the individual. Um, I tell patients that the data says that somewhere around 20 to 25 percent of women who have a breast augmentation will have another operation on their breast within the first 10 years. Now that can be for any reason. It can be that they decide they want to go bigger, they want to go smaller, they decide that um, maybe they've had children, they want to have a breast lift. There's a whole host of different reasons. But if you're getting regular imaging of the breast and the implant looks good and you like the way they look, I don't know of any medical reason that requires you to have to have the implants exchanged at 10 years. That being said, we have a lot of patients who come in uh, around that time and say, you know, uh, it's been 10 years and I'm just wanting a different implant and just for peace of mind, I've heard this implant's really a, a nicer one. For example, you may have had the traditional silicone implants that look like that and now it's been 10 years and now there are these really nice, highly cohesive gel ones and you say, you know, I just want them exchanged out. We see that all the time as well. Um, do you recommend weight loss for a mommy makeover? I, yeah, I mean, it depends on what you weigh, of course. I want you to be as close to your the weight that you want to live at as possible. I don't have any strict cutoff, like you have to weigh X in order to have the surgery. I don't think that's fair because women, are, the distribution on a woman's body is very different. There's some patients who, you know, if you look at their height and their weight, you would say, oh, they're, you know, they're not overweight. But then when you see them, they're carrying a lot of their weight um, behind the muscle of their abdomen. It's called visceral fat. And that's really not a good situation in order to, uh, that's not a good starting point for a tummy tuck because you're not going to get a great result in that situation. On the other hand, there's other women who are kind of pear-shaped and so when you look at their height and weight you say wow they look kind of heavy but you realize that they're carrying most of their weight below their waist. It's on, on their thighs. So if they want a tummy tuck or a breast lift, uh, you know, losing weight is not going to alter that. So it really depends on the individual. And I, But I do tell folks, look, if you're wanting to spend all this money on, the, on an operation like that, it's, it's better if you get at cl as close as you can to the weight you want to live at, you'll get a better result that way. And some patients say to me, you know, I've tried really hard for months to get to this weight. This is where I want to live at. I can't go any lower, but maybe afterwards I will. And we can talk about that. And that's reasonable for a lot of patients. 
Um, what is your favorite operation and which one do you find the most challenging? Well, that's a good question. I get asked that a lot. And, you know, honestly, I don't have one operation that's my favorite. Luckily for me, um, I get to do all sorts of different things. Um, face, noses, breast, body, I do all of it. I think the, the some of the more challenging ones are actually the most fun for me. So one of the things I really like to do are, uh, I like to take care of women who've had previous breast surgeries elsewhere and they haven't unfortunately got the result they want and they come in to me for revision surgeries. To me that's a lot of fun because you're really using all the tools in your tool toolbox or your imagination, all the different um, implants and there's other things we can talk about like internal bras that we use. There's one called Stratus for example that I really like using. I like taking care of those patients um, because you can get a really dramatic change uh, especially for someone's, uh, you know, someone's been through a lot. Uh, we actually have a whole uh, uh, page on our website uh, gallery dedicated just to revision breast surgery, so that's kind of fun. Um, are there any signs or symptoms with a ruptured silicone implant? Uh, that's a great question. So they, it can be anything from no symptoms, no signs, to um, having a deformity of the breast. So I tell patients that, you know, if you had a, if you have like a car accident or a, you know, ATV accident or a bike accident or something like that where you fall and you all of a sudden you have all this bruising on your chest, I think it's really important to talk to your doc or call us and let's get some imaging to see what it looks like. Usually an ultrasound is usually enough. If they're not sure, then we can have, get, have you get an MRI. Um, but there are patients who do have what's called a silent rupture where they don't know anything's going on and they do get a rupture of it. It's still, there's still no data that says even in that situation it's a threat to your health in any way. Um, but we would want to take a look at you and see if we need to do some imaging if we're not sure and perhaps exchange the implants out. To receive the fullness on top with the ideal implant, do you have to have it overfilled? Um, I think that depends on your anatomy. So some women have really tight skin, especially um, perhaps younger women who haven't had children yet. When you have kind of tighter skin, and also one of the things I talk a lot about with my patients is how long the torso is. So the distance from the fold of the breast to the collarbone. If that's short, and you have really tight skin through here, you don't really need to go too big with the implant because you're gonna get that fullness because there's no real space for the implant to settle in. On the other hand, it, um, women who uh, maybe are a little bit older, maybe have had children, have some looser skin, you may need to overfill it a little bit in order to get that fullness. The good news is with the ideals is they're, they have very specific guidelines and criteria for how much to fill, what the range is of fill for the both the front and the back valve, how much to fill that implant Per, uh, for e any given width uh, to get the look you want. So there's a lot of leeway with it. Um, could you use a periolo areolar incision for a behind the muscle implant? Um, you can. There's a couple of important things about that. Number one, we want to make sure that the areola is big enough <laughs> to fit the implant in. Um, some women have very small areolas and we don't want to damage it or try to stretch things too much to try to put the implant in through that. The one thing I want to be clear about, about that, with, uh, with patients about that though is that there is some data to suggest that using that incision increases the chance of a capsule forming, of a capsular contracture. So we have to weigh the risk and benefit of that. Um, so for example, if a woman has a really well-defined fold that we can easily hide an incision in, I want to talk to them about really using that incision because I think it's a better choice. On the other hand, imagine a woman who's got really wide areolas and a really short distance from the nipple to the fold, really tight distance. That's someone we could certainly consider putting the incision through the areola because it's gonna hide there really beautifully. So we gotta to tailor to everyone, but it's important to know that. If you're going through the areola, that risk of a capsule forming goes up. Is it possible to change to a smaller implant and still have a good result? Uh, yeah, it, it totally is. We see that all the time. A little bit, a little bit of it depends on um, the patient, what their anatomy looks like now, how much of a difference they wanna have. So if you're going from a 700 cc implant to 200 cc's, we're probably going to have to talk about what we would need to do with that excess skin. On the other hand, if you're just going down a little bit and your skin quality is pretty good, usually it'll kind of tighten up a little bit around that implant so you can avoid having to do any sort of skin excision. Um, the other thing we would do in those cases is if we're not sure we're going to need to do, for example, a lift or some other type of skin excision procedure, we would exchange the implants and then just let your body settle in. Let's let the implant settle for a few months and see where we're at and then decide if we need to go back and do anything. You guys are making me talk today. This is great. <laughs> um, still catching on fire. I know. So good. So let me go over a couple more questions. Um, one of the other things we talked about, the, uh, uh, Lori Christmer asked, how does the consult work? I hope um, 
we answer that for you. Um, and then we talk about weight loss. Yeah, the let's see, it's a, the Ruth Portal, Truth, Truth, Truth Portal Three. We asked about mommy makeover weight loss. And another question from Dr. Sarah Khan is, how long after C-section can I do a tummy tuck? That's a great question. So. Whether you've got a C-section or a normal vaginal delivery, um, either way, we want to make sure a few things have happened. One, that the, you're feeling back to yourself. I mean, having a baby is a huge, obviously, massive, massive deal, um, physically, emotionally, all the things that go into it. So we want to make sure that physically you feel like you're kind of back down to kind of where you were afterwards, the skin's loosened again, um, that um, you have the time to take off from you know work, or if you're taking care of the baby, you have some a lot of help to help you take care of the baby. Um, I typically see patients for their consult anywhere as early as three months after a C-section. Uh, sometimes uh, more likely is about four to six months afterwards. Um, but then afterwards, if you feel like you're ready to go and your anatomy looks reasonable for it, we can totally get it done then. Um, good transition into, do breast implants affect breastfeeding? Yeah, so the, the short answer is there's no data that says the placement of an implant will um, make it more difficult to breastfeed. When we do our augmentations, almost always, at least in our practice, we're placing the implants behind the muscle and we're almost always using that fold incision, that incision of the breast. Now why that's important is when we make that incision, we're just seeing the edge of the muscle and then we're placing the implant behind the muscle. So we're not disrupting any of the connections between the nipple and the breast tissue. So. I would be very surprised if just that the act of placing that implant behind the muscle would in any way affect the ability to breastfeed. It's important to remember though that there's a pretty significant percentage of women nationwide that when they have a child they're not able to produce enough milk or not able to breastfeed. So what I tell patients is if you have an augmentation and then you have a pregnancy and then you're not able to breastfeed, um, it's probably not because of the implant, it's probably because you just happen to be in that group of women that weren't able to breastfeed at all. Um, how often are you doing lipo of the breast in conjunction with the implant to contour the breast? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't often like to liposuction the breast, personally. Um, the breast is a, is a mixture of breast tissue and fat. I think it'd be challenging um, to get that contour right in that situation because you can lipo uh, fat but not breast tissue. That would be difficult. Certainly if someone has some excess tissue, skin, or fat that they want to excise directly, that's usually kind of in the lower portion of the breast or the outer kind of extending to the lateral portion of the breast. That's possible to do at the time of an augmentation, but liposuctioning the whole breast and then putting an implant in, I have not done that. I'm not sure that that is, it'd be hard to imagine uh, getting a really good result with that. I'm sure there's some surgeons who in their hands can, but it's not something I do regularly. Cool, uh, I think that is it in terms of questions. One final little bonus, what I wanted to do is, I've been asked a lot, can I cut one of these implants? So I thought, let's cut one of the implants. So you guys can see one of these silicone implants, what it, what it looks like. Now, this is live, and this is a pretty old implant that's been sitting around in the air for you know, years. So I'm hoping it's gonna look the way I want it to look. Um, let's see if we can, Make that work. Can you see that okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, all right, so I'm gonna go ahead and cut it. Cool. So I've cut the, I wanna show you this. I've cut the, so I've cut it now. So I'm just show you when I push on it. So this is a, this is a silicone implant to watch, pushing and letting go. So highly cohesive gel, no liquid all the way. You guys can see that from the angles. It's kind of a cool deal. So that, that's what they look like. And this is actually not even the most highly cohesive. This is um, one level less. So great. Well, I hope that was informative. I hope folks like it. Um, did we get everyone's questions answered? Um, one more question is bartend for a living, um, always on her feet and using her arms constantly throughout her shift. How long would you recommend staying home um, it doesn't say for what procedure, but. Yeah, I would say whether you're doing a breast augmentation or a tummy tuck, that's really, you know, being a bartender is just, I mean, it's really hard on your body. I would be very cautious about that. I would probably say three or four weeks of just really kind of taking it easy, um, just because you're gonna spend a lot of money on these operations. We certainly don't want you to have any setbacks or any problems from going back to work too early. So if you're able to plan it out, so you have a few weeks off, I think you will do great. Everyone's pointing out that you're a lefty. <laughs> 
Yeah, well, I'm weird that way. I um, I do certain things lefty and certain things righty. So <laughs> I write left-handed. Um, I shave left-handed. I brush my teeth left-handed. I eat left-handed, but I uh, operate right-handed most most of the time. Occasionally, I do some stuff left-handed. If I go in for a high five, I go right-handed. All right. <laughs> but here's the other weird one. I am right eye dominant, but left ear dominant. So when I pick up a phone, I go to my left. I don't know. So I kind of do both. You're unique. That's. That's a fun way of putting it. That's a good way of putting it, yeah. Um, thanks, guys. We'll see you next Wednesday. I think next Wednesday is all about tummy tuck, so we're pumped. Thank you. Thank you.